Hi. Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. We're going to start a new series today dealing with <clears throat> what I call the mechanization of art. Uh, the effects of technology, uh, industrialization, warfare, the whole process of change and breakdown of traditions in the 20th century, but essentially uh, for whatever reason, but I suspect it is uh, caused basically by the disruption called, brought about by the rapid increase of technology, the essential, the mechanization of art uh, resulting in artworks that look more like machines than they do like the natural world, the mechanization of human beings so that they look more like uh, robots or adjuncts of machinery than they look like uh, natural organic parts of the God created universe if, if we want to think of it that way. Let's take a look at our first picture <clears throat> and see very graphically a, an example of how the process uh, develops. Uh, in uh, Poussin's Arcadian Shepherds painted in the 16th century <clears throat> we see uh, mankind in a an ideal environment, uh, a world of, of stable values, but then we start looking at the figures and we begin to see a certain disquiet emanating perhaps from the central two figures, not yet reaching the periphery of the, the grouping. And they're examining a tombstone and of ages past and it says, we too once were happy in Arcadia. And uh, the question of mortality of the swift passing of human life, no matter how apparently permanent and desirable and pleasurable it is, it all passes, it all changes. And the reason we're looking at the Poussin is to see a similar feeling of a certain stability. I don't think we'll see the sense of, of, of threatening self-awareness, awareness of mortality uh, that we have in uh, Poussin's picture, but We'll see Cezanne in his late great picture, The Card Players, undoubtedly influenced by Poussin. And we substitute the table for the tombstone. We have the four figures in a different grouping, but still with a sense of tremendous uh, personal solidity and personal interaction. We think of the hands grouped around the table as Poussin's uh, figures hands were grouped around the tombstone, and we see in Cezanne a sense of, of monumental immutability, unchangeability of the validity of human experience, if you will, the validity of human existence on earth, that human beings are worth painting, that our lives are worth living, that the whole great experiment, <clears throat> cosmic experiment that none of us uh, really understands, but senses perhaps now and then reasons and causes and ultimate meanings that all is well in, in the universe in a sense and that man's life is worthwhile. <clears throat> now let's keep in mind Cezanne's <clears throat> card players and move toward uh, <clears throat> Leger's card players painted in 1917 and let's look at the obvious differences. It, it's a shocking a shocking uh, depiction of robotized tin man, th man thrashing and clanking. We can literally, this is literally a picture of sound, <clears throat> of the bashing together of, of arms that are steel tubes, shoulders that look almost like open beer cans, heads that disintegrate into metal <clears throat> hair dryers in a sense, as if the hair dryer <laughs> had, had substituted for the human head and uh, <clears throat> makes us think of of people becoming semi-robots when they get their hair done in, in a very symbolic sense. But look, look what's happened in our 20th century. My premise is <clears throat> that early in the 20th century uh, there were tremendous pressures. The First World War, which was the greatest mechanized war of all time up to that point, the rapid increase of technology brought shocking psychological change and, and suffering, psychological suffering to people as well as physical suffering, and the artists reflected this. Now. Uh, I think it's too bad that the artists did in one sense because they, this is unquestionably questionably to me a very negative, destructive image. But on the other hand, we can say, well, would we have done any better or would we have seen the world more positively 
if we had lived at that time? And probably the question is no. The answer is no. <laughs> the premise I'm working toward is that even today in the 1980s <clears throat> and all through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and, and hopefully not into the 90s, we are witnessing a continual mechanization of art, the continual dehumanization of, of subject matter. <clears throat> And I think the time has come to change. I think it long has passed when the time came when art should have changed, when it should have sought more positive, more humane, more human values. <clears throat> Let's look at another early example <clears throat> by uh, Severini, the futurist painter in a work called War. <clears throat> Excuse me, I... <clears throat> war. I'm declaring war on my vocal cords here, they're in rebellion. <clears throat> uh, we see a futurist painting, Severini, a man, member of the futurists, but obviously influenced by Cubism, as Leger's painting was, and Cubism is the archetype, archetype of mechanized art in our time. We see the words effort maximum at the bottom of the picture, talking about the uh, <clears throat> all-out industrial effort to crush the opposition, to create monsters of war that will eat up and destroy the enemy. We see the airplane engine in the center of the propeller. We see symbolic smokestacks uh, that can also be cannons mouths. We see something that looks like an anchor on the right hand side that seems almost like a perversion of the Christian cross. <coughs> and we're going to be moving to another picture very soon <coughs> for our camera people to be alert here. <coughs> So that we see a, a fracturing of the image, we see it as a symbolic fracturing of our own environment, <coughs> our own psychic struggle and our own vocal struggle. And we see it clearly in this next slide coming up. Duchamp Villon's horse, uh, sculpted in 1914, the year of the First World War. And uh, perhaps you can't make out the horse, perhaps you can, uh, the head on the right the neck and, and shoulders coming down through the left, and we see that the horse has become mechanized. It's become literally a cog in the machinery of industrialization that sweeps the Western world in the 20th century, that sweeps us off our feet, that sweeps us off our psychological uh, balance, that cuts our roots with our past uh, relationships, relations to the past, and we're floating, denuded, struggling in, in, a, in a vacuum of, of nuts and bolts and cogs and wheels and, and arms and levers. <clears throat> and it's clearly evident in this picture by, not a picture, but a sculpture by uh, uh, Picasso, the head of his mistress, Fernand Olivier, sculpted in 1909. We see the same, <clears throat> and I'm not saying this isn't a powerful sculpture, I'm not saying that the Duchamp Villon horse was not a powerful sculpture. They are, obviously, in the manipulation of forms, uh, negative and positive spaces. But, but it seems clear that on the negative side, it's depicting humanity as uh, a destroyed entity, organic human life and destroyed entity in the 20th century. <clears throat> then it was probably bad enough but it was probably needed to draw human attention to the fact of our, our distortions, our sufferings. And Picasso, in the uh, painting Le Demoiselles d'Avignon, the first Cubist picture, shows us again the uh, depersonalization of humanity, the mechanization of humanity, and the desire to go toward the primitive and the masks and the various heads, uh, the, particularly the two on the right, uh, where a mechanization combines with uh, the desire to find new roots, to find a, a, a deep connection with the inner mysteries of life, and that's why they go to Africa. Uh, they don't understand Africa, and I, obviously I don't pretend to understand Africa, but in its strangeness to Western man, it seemed to offer alternatives, a touch with the great mysteries of life that had been denuded by the machinery of 20th century attitudes. The science had let man down in the 20th century and they turned to ritualistic uh, 
trances, in a sense, artistic trances, in order to find uh, meaning in their lives. Picasso's Woman in a Chair, another clear example of the suffering of humanity, the mechanization of humanity. And in 1909, and we go to the, his three dancers, <coughs> in 1928 in a semi-surrealistic vein and we see humanity stripped of all but its desperation and its darkness savaged by the horrors of 20th century life and the figure on the left is this grinning toothless tooth toothy monster the one in the center seems to be a crucified figure of of us each individual crucified the sadness of that dripping black eye and then on the right the darker underbelly of contemporary humanity uh, aiding in the crucifixion of ourselves, the ourselves crucifying ourselves in a sense. It's in these pictures and sculptures that we witness the destruction of humanity and we might say, well, why is this uh, fellow talking about it? Because I, I think that imagery like this and in our next program we'll see uh, contemporary imagery <coughs> It's, it's destructive to us. It adds more weight and horror of, of uh, corporate impersonality, uh, mechanized dehumanization that simply robs us of our individuality. I mean, we're all saying, gee, I'm only a number in society. I can't do anything. I can't change anything. My life doesn't mean anything. We may not come out actually saying that, but we feel it. And so the malaise gets deeper and deeper in America and certainly uh, all of industrialized uh, countries. Maybe Japan is still carried uh, forward on a, a certain euphoria of commercial achievement, but uh, there's unhappiness and un a sense of a lack of fulfillment uh, everywhere. And Leger's soldier with a pipe, the mechanized robot again, uh, puffing furiously trying to find his way out of the dilemma the modern tin man in our own contemporary Wizard of Oz look at the heat that builds up in the head the, the only area of red color as his his temperature rises he's ready to blow a stack his squinched eyes and those bowling ball cannonball uh, smoke forms that come out of the pipe and Leger's Nudes in the Forest, painted around <clears throat> before the First World War, we have a tremendous symbol of humanity roiling and rattling and struggling, foundationless, lost in the rubble and wreckage of their civilization, uh, clinging to their machinery and their hopes. You know, oh boy, we can fly across the Atlantic. Look what Lindbergh will do. Lindbergh hasn't done it yet. Look what science can do. Look how it improves our lives. Look at all our new cars coming off the assembly line. All the while feeling very, very hollow. Leger's woman with a vase painted later in a somewhat different style. Isn't she almost like a contemporary Mona Lisa? Uh, a bowling ball head, lever arms holding her vase or pedestal. Uh, almost as if she's machined her hair. Uh, a t she didn't have a Tony to get that done and, and she, uh, it looks like it was laid on by a bulldozer flattening it out and, and pressing it oilily to her, her head. Uh, keep in mind the expression on her face and the simple handling of the figure. She almost is a contemporary Mona Lisa. As we look at da Vinci's handling of a symbolic human figure. Of course da Vinci is working here in a, an idealistic state. She's partly a real woman, but she's also an ideal of femininity, of the mystery of life, just as we could say Leger's was an ideal of the modern machined human being, the, the woman who becomes a, a ball bearing in, in a sense. And if uh, da Vinci's is idealized, where is the artist today who will paint a mall bab like Franz Halls did, this tavern habitue of 17th century Holland with her owl on her shoulder symbolizing her, <coughs> her darker human side perhaps, but she cackles with a certain uh, life, a certain vividness of character and 
substituting for Leger's vase or pedestal, she has her beer mug on the right side of the picture. Matisse is a uh, 20th century giant uh, in terms of his effect on other artists. And we look at a, a still life of apples on a pink cloth. And uh, there's probably no question that a picture like this is a masterpiece uh, of design, of color, of structure. Uh, there's a, a tremendous influence from Cezanne here, the solidity of the fruit, the solid, simple modeling of it, the similar qualities in the cloth. <coughs> Where Matisse asserts himself most clearly is in the background with the two-dimensional uh, relationship of floral shapes and the two golden uh, columns on either side, uh, patterns in wallpaper, presumably. Uh, I admire a picture like this tremendously because I think it's, it's beautiful. It, it has to do with reality, which I think humanity needed tremendously in the 20th century and needs today. We've lost touch with it. Uh, but look what happens in, in this next picture where the piano lesson, a, a famous painting by Matisse, and uh, a masterpiece of design, no question about it, but look how machined and mechanized this becomes. Under the influence of cubism, he breaks the picture up into two-dimensional surfaces, uh, sharp areas. Look at the human elements, the woman in the background in a chair, supervising seemingly the youngster at the piano. <clears throat> there are strong psychological reverberations in the picture. But, but I would say that as beautiful a, a design this, as this is, um, it is pointless. If it wasn't pointless for Matisse to do it, and I think it was not, uh, it certainly is pointless for contemporary artists to do it. And we look at a work by Richard Diebenkorn, uh, Man and Woman in a Large Room, painted in the late 50s, uh, <clears throat> obviously under the influence of Matisse's uh, compositional structure. Uh, and in his later pictures, Diebenkorn will become totally abstract using Matissean structure uh, to the point of futility, unfortunately. We, we just don't need his later work where it's geometrically inhuman and uh, unhelpful to the health of, of us all. And here in this picture, this isn't to say that it doesn't have a certain starkness, a certain sense of the emptiness, the barrenness of our lives. But, but I think really by 1957, when this was painted, and certainly in 19, whatever it is, 81, we don't need to be told how barren our lives are. We know full well, far too well, how barren they are, how barren society has become in many instances. And we need people to help show us the way out of this. And this is the failure of contemporary art echoing the problems of uh, the past rather than uh, trying to work for solutions for the present. And, and it becomes uh, tedious and, and it's unhealthy to watch symbols, uh, to see symbols that are uh, so denuded and so powerless and so uh, perverted, really. Stuart Davis, uh, uh, an American artist with a great reputation, and a picture perhaps uh, suggesting, painted in the 1960s, perhaps talking about the wonders of American uh, machine products. Is it based on champion spark plugs and an auto product? Certainly a striking image. And <clears throat> for an older artist, he was you know, in his 60s or 70s when he painted this picture, uh, who had developed over the 20th century as a modernist, as a cubist, uh, perhaps acceptable. But for uh, a younger artist to ape this, and the pop artists and the hard edge artists, I think it's not helpful. We see another artist, Milton Avery, painted 1940, uh, 41 or so, mother and child. Uh, isn't this a pathetic picture? Isn't it really uh, pathetic in terms of its poverty-stricken aesthetics, the, the fact that 
we have be removed so f removed ourselves so far from uh, an experience of life into this remote world of aesthetic manipulation. And seemingly it would be about as far as we could go, but of course we've gone much farther than this. But keep in mind the fact there's no face on any either of the figures. The figures are simply shapes. And let's look at Mary Cassatt's uh, The Bath, painted in the late 19th century, a similar composition. How much we lost in terms of artistic power. There's no question, at least in my mind, and perhaps many of you will agree, that this picture is much more solid in structure, in, in, in form, uh, in composition, much more developed, much more uh, complex, and richly so in terms of what it expresses. Compare that with de Chirico's The Painter's Family, painted in the early 20th century, and, and, and what a uh, a, a terrible indictment of humanity this is, of the world, where the heads become simply mannequins' heads, the bodies, mannequin bodies, and uh, I can't even see the baby, but the baby seems almost to be uh, a building structure in a sense there. He manages somehow to get a certain uh, family uh, a tenderness of familial feeling in it, but at what price? He, he's saying that maybe there's a little bit of human feeling left while we're all turning into uh, buildings and structures. I mean, part of the bodies are, are made of, of con seemingly co cast concrete. And perhaps this is the modern society in De Chirico's nostalgia of the infinite with that brooding frightening tower, almost like a monolithic uh, dictatorship, in a sense, rising above the arid plain. And we see the th threatening little shadow coming from behind the structure on the right in the sunlit area, uh, suggesting who knows what evil portents to arrive. And the two figures in the center dwarfed by society. It's almost as if we have a picture of, of fascism here or communism, in a sense, of uh, De Chirico, an Italian painter painting before the advent of Mussolini. But uh, I don't think it takes too much stretch of an imagination to see a connection here. And in Carlo Cara's hermaphroditic idol, painted during the First World War, Cara, uh, <coughs> a follower of De Chirico, or at least an associate, and we see this mannequin uh, in a gesture that is half thumbing of the nose, half a papal blessing, uh, the saying that there is uh, a, a tremendous barrenness and a tremendous hopelessness. Willem de Kooning in 1940 paints a painting called The Queen of Hearts, and uh, it, it really is a, a kind of a sad commentary, not only on art but on de Kooning's artistic state. Uh, it's, it, it has a feeling of, of dissociation from humanity, a, a tremendous uh, debt, aesthetic debt to Picasso and Matisse, and, and, and really kind of a sad statement that the human figure, that that's all that we could come up with in a painting of the human figure in 1940. And, and it is so uh, second rate, really, and, and so derivative that the, I, I can see, just from this point of view, why de Kooning would, uh, would go into this in the 1950s in his women series. This is Woman 2, where he expresses his whole rage, outrage, and frustration and hostility at not only the world, but the condition of art, his own artistic position, where he, he really has been saying nothing original up to this point. Uh, and this will look good compared to some of the artists that will be coming along in, in, in the tail end of this program and the beginning of next in terms of at least it exhibits outrage, at least it exhibits some kind of human feeling rather than the cold impersonality that, that is the dominant element of our time. And, and compare this with the John Mott Smith's computer drawing suggesting a human being. And, and, and haven't we 
scrape the bottom of the barrel when we do something like this. Uh, even in the name of experiment, if it's going to be put in slide form so that we can see it here, it's put in books. Uh, if, if we turn to the Xerox machine to create our artworks, if we uh, simply use camera images and manipulate them in silk screen as Andy Warhol, Robert Rauschenberg uh, have done and, and, and we'll see. Uh, I think we, we really have scraped the bottom of the barrel and the time has come to reverse our course, to slow down a little bit, to forget the hype and the publicity that comes from the galleries and the museums. They're all caught up in this unfortunately and, and sometimes I really wonder who are those that are dehumanized in our times. I really think that the, the vast citizenry of America, if we just speak of America, is, is, is in pretty good shape. Their, their instincts are pretty solid. They know uh, a few things, a few of the things that are needed to make a life have meaning, to have worth. Uh, I think it's our leaders that are the ones that have become most uh, dehumanized, most technologized, most mechanized, and, and I think specifically of the art leaders, the gallery directors, the critics, the artists, the museum curators. I think of the art magazines and, and their editors, and I, I think of, of corpor corporations and their presidents. Uh, we live in this, this corporate state that symbolizes impersonality, money over everything. Their corporate structures are clean and sleek and cold and dehumanized as their products are. And, and I think all of those people have come together in the media, in the television, in the images that we see daily to present a a feeling, a facade, um, a, a sense that uh, of almost a, a hovering miasma in a sense, uh, a, a tremendous unanim unanimity of attitude that says everything has to be sleek and cold and machine-like and depersonalized. And uh, I don't think it has to be, but it's going to take a tremendous effort on a lot of artists' part and those insightful people, sensitive people in the art world and the corporate world to bring about a change for the better. We'll talk more about this next time. Program's Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Thanks for being with me. Bye-bye.